Hello and welcome to this presentation. Today we're going to discuss ransomware, what it is, what you can do to prevent it, and how you can recover if you get infected. I'm Jeremy Cooper with Sabre Consulting and let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk specifically what is ransomware. Well, it's a form of malware whose purpose is to encrypt your files. And once that encryption has been done, the key belongs to the cyber criminals who then require the end user or organization to pay to get that key. And how do they do the payment? Through cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. Why? Because these are easy to use but also hard to track. So it's safer and it is a very profitable way to do business. Now ransomware doesn't just impact super large organizations, it also includes smaller organizations, hospitals, school districts, small businesses, banks. Um, here recently in the news we heard uh, about how HBO has had some information stolen. Um, but one of the things we have to keep in mind with ransomware as we move forward is don't think of it as some type of boogeyman. In the end, it's just malware. So the same ways that we protect our machines against malware are also how we protect against ransomware. But one of the biggest things is ransomware is a particularly nasty form of malware, and we have to make sure that we have a very rock-solid backup strategy behind because we're not looking to necessarily restore systems, we're preserving our data. Now, depending upon the scenario, it may make financial sense to businesses to just simply pay the ransom, especially if the amount of man hours it would take to recover the data is cost prohibitive. Not to mention the fact that while that data is encrypted and your IT staff are restoring it, it's not being used to drive business. Another reason that organizations will often pay the ransom is simply they either did not have backups, the backups were inadequate, or worst case scenario, the backups themselves got encrypted. One of the main reasons that organizations such as the FBI recommend not paying the ransom is because one, it doesn't guarantee you're gonna get your files back. Two, you are encouraging and giving incentive to cyber criminals to continue to step up attacks. Not to mention the fact they now know that you will pay and so they may target your organization again. And one of the more frightening things I read recently in a McAfee publication is that there is evidence that future ransomware attacks are going to focus on slowly and silently encrypting data for weeks so that encrypted files get, start, get put into your backup routine, meaning that backups, which are one of the very best ways to recover from a ransomware attack, may be rendered less useful. And so it's very important, therefore, to have plans with your, within your organization to make sure you have a very lengthy retention and, and perhaps mo most importantly, that your backups are stored in an offsite and secure manner so that if you get attacked, your backups are not accessible from infected computers, thereby being encrypted. Let's talk briefly about incident response. This is basically how do you respond when you get the call saying, my machine has ransomware. The first thing you need to do is quickly identify the scope of the infection. Does this appear to be isolated to a single computer or is it an entire building or your entire organization? Also, do those computers have write access to file shares through map drives? If so, it's entirely possible that those locations have been compromised as well. So as quickly as you can, get infected computers disconnected from the network. And if it appears that this is going to be a system-wide infection, get your file shares off the network as well. So basically, whether that's manually shutting down shares, disconnecting network adapters, or powering off servers, get things contained. You want to contain the spread of the infection as quickly as possible. And recommendation is do not try to clean these infected computers, completely re-image them. And that also means you want to make sure that your images are also protected from malware and ransomware as well. And once the infection has been halted, the machines have been scrubbed, and you can verify they're clean, this is the point at which you go ahead and restore your encrypted files from a valid backup. And last but not least, contact the FBI, let them know you were attacked, give them the particulars, they're gathering data on this, and it will help the cyber defense organizations 
to be able to eradicate these problems in the future. Finally, we are at the meat and potatoes of this presentation where we discuss actual things you can put in practice to protect yourself and your organization from ransomware. First on my list, I know it sounds very trite, but seriously, educate your users. Make sure they know what type of attacks are out there. Specifically, we're talking about be careful of what websites you visit, be careful on clicking on downloads and links on websites, and most importantly, be alert for phishing attacks. And if, you, and if your end users think they, they may have received an email that's a phishing email, make sure they feel comfortable reaching out to you and saying, hey, is this legit? Next, if at all possible, Make sure your users are operating from a principle of least privilege. What I mean by that is they should not be local admins on their computer. This has both political and technical ramifications. Political because end users will complain to their supervisors because it can be inconvenient. It can also be political because higher individuals in your organization are going to be resistant to this. But by doing this, by making sure your users do not have admin rights, then if they do download a malicious attachment or something of that nature, then there is a, there is a limited scope to what the malware can do. It doesn't prevent every form of attack, but it significantly reduces the threat vector. So if you have the, the political clout to do this in your organization, it is definitely worth it. Now, going hand in hand with this, and this is sometimes even harder to convince people, is IT staff should not run as administrative, uh, as as administrators on their computer because you get those machines in, impacted, and we're not just talking about individual desktops. IT staff typically have a great deal of power. Additionally, if at all possible, limit users to read access to file shares unless there really is a good reason that users are writing files. This is a bit of a no-brainer, but make sure you're utilizing antivirus, as well as a spam filter if you host your own email. And a content filter or a firewall that blocks malware is very, very important. For example, both Juniper and Palo Alto have technologies that will actively scan files that you and your clients download from the internet and check to see if the file is malicious by, by scanning signatures. And if so, for example, Juniper Sky ATP can then send a kill switch and disable that computer from the network or block the download. I cannot adequately stress the importance of making sure your servers, desktops, and networking equipment is properly patched. That especially goes for any web servers that are internet facing. We all heard about the WannaCry virus in May of 2017 that impacted anywhere from 150,000 to 200,000 desktops with ransomware. While many of these machines were Windows XP and Windows Server 2003 machines, which Microsoft ceased supporting about three years ago, a good number of Windows 7, 8, 10, and modern Windows Server operating systems were also hit with WannaCry because they were not properly patched. Microsoft released a patch in March of 2017 to address these vulnerabilities. However, we saw a good number of machines that should have not been impacted get hit. It is very, very important to make sure you have a proper strategy. Many environments use Windows Update Services, or WSUS. Make sure you have internal controls in place to ensure that your computers are receiving those updates as soon as possible. Yes, there is wisdom. While many organizations have reason to hold back on updates, it is a good idea to go ahead and test the updates on lower impact computers before deploying to the rest. And provided you do this in a pretty timely manner, it should be okay, a couple of weeks at the most. Your backup strategy is a key component to recovering from an attack from ransomware. The most important aspect of this is that the machines, the desktops and servers themselves, should not have read-write access directly to where you're, lo where you're storing your backups. They need to be off-site. And an agent-based solution is often a great idea, especially if your users operate in a limited 
um, in a limited user environment to where they cannot install software and cannot operate as an administrator. If your backups are through Windows file shares, map drives, or for instance at home, USB hard drives, and you leave these file locations connected at all times, then if your computer gets ransomware, it is very, very easy then for the ransomware to encrypt your backups, thereby rendering your best form of recovery unusable. At home, you can protect your backups from encryption by unplugging your USB hard drive in between backups. Another idea would be to manually move your backups to a network drive on, say, a NAS, and make sure that your computer is not mapped to that drive with read-write permissions. And be very selective about opening ports to the outside world. For example, if you have a Linux server on your network that is managed by an outside company, give them either VPN access or only open up port 22 for their public IP addresses. Never open up port 22 to the outside world unless you absolutely have to. In this next slide, we're going to discuss some hardening tactics that you can employ on desktops, both at home and in a corporate environment to protect yourself against malware. Interestingly enough, one of the latest threat vectors has been JavaScript. JavaScript has been around for a long time and it is primarily a web technology. Every website you visit these days has JavaScript running, provided, providing a dynamic environment for your web providing a dynamic environment for websites. However, JavaScript can also execute on local machines, although there aren't that many good reasons for it to happen. Some of the best recommendations for protecting your end users against JavaScript attacks is one, configure Windows to show file extensions. That way, if you educate your end users to be wary of JavaScript, provided they see that the file is a .js, they'll be wary. Another thing you can do is change your de the default application that executes JavaScript. This can be done both on a per computer basis or through a group policy preference. And if you want to get really hardcore, you can entirely disable Windows scripting host. But I would recommend you test that in an environment and make sure that you're not going to impact production. So let's take a look at a simulated JavaScript attack. Here I have a RDP session into a Windows 10 desktop and we have an invoice zip file downloaded to the desktop. If we right click and extract the file, here is invoice.pdf. So first off we should see that it's got a scripting icon and over here in the type column we see JavaScript file. But if our end users are not looking for these red flags and they still click it because it says invoice.pdf, then this file will write then this file will execute and can download malware and ransomware because JavaScript is a web technology with, in conjunction with HTML and CSS, JavaScript is part of what powers the internet, but it can also execute as a local Windows, but it can also be executed by Windows scripting host on a desktop, although there are not very many good reasons for this to happen. So, the first thing we can do is go under the view options and check file name extensions. And now that we can see the file extension, we should be much more wary about opening it. Additionally, you can right click and select open with and choose another application. There you go. Ideally, however, you'll go ahead and if you click choose another app, you can check always use this app to open JS files. And now, our icon changes to notepad and we have rendered and we have rendered it pretty much impossible for javascript to be executed and we have rendered it highly unlikely that an end user will accidentally execute a javascript file locally next we're going to look at how to set this up on an enterprise wide environment using windows group policy so I'm going to show this in a group policy preference, but keep in mind what we're going to do is uh, make a registry change. This can also be done with either a log on or log off script uh, and a reg file, or you could manually update the registry. But again, for demonstration purposes, we're going to go the registry, registry 
But for demonstration purposes, we're going to do this in the registry. So back in that same GPO, under Windows Settings and Registry, we can add a new registry item. And it's going to be a reg D word, well, well sorry. And we're gonna to go to H key local machine. And now we're gonna to go to key path. Okay, H key local machine, software. Sorry, uh, Microsoft, Windows script host. So let's see if the W works, yes. Windows script host and settings, very good. Click select. Now, value name is going to be enabled. And this is going to be a reg D word. And the value is zero. Apply. All right. Let's go back to our Windows client and GP Update Force. All right. Let's see if we can force Windows Crypt Host. There you go. Windows Crypt Host access is disabled on this machine. Another threat has been macros executed from files downloaded from the internet. We can show you how to go into group policy in conjunction with Office 2016 and force a setting change that, so that end users cannot enable macro execution from files obtained from the internet. Also, Windows PowerShell is a dangerous threat vector and oftentimes is not needed. We can go into the registry and disable that. And installing an ad blocker can protect your users against malicious pop-ups that might draw their attention. In this slide, we're going to discuss some things that we can do as sysadmins to harden our environment and make it harder for malware and ransomware to spread once it's infected a single computer. The prevailing wisdom in password policies is beginning to change. We're now moving into a phase where very long passwords that employ simple to remember words with an occasional special character are much, much harder harder to break than the standard minimum of eight characters and employ password complexity and change every 42 days. In addition, seriously consider using Active Directory group policy to configure account lockout policies so that brute force attacks get shut down very quickly. And it's still a good idea to rename your domain admin accounts to something different and hard to guess and innocuous. But Go ahead and create a standard user account named admin and administrator and set up security logging and use it as a honeypot to see if anyone is trying to break into your accounts. We're gonna drop into group policy and we are going to go to our default domain policy where we're gonna configure our account password settings and lockout policy. So we right click edit, maximize it, go to policies, windows settings, Security settings, account policies. We're gonna first go to the password policy, and right now this is the default password policy that Microsoft has recommended. And uh, as I've said previously, we recommend going with a much larger password, longer password, the changes less frequently, and doesn't have to be littered with special characters. We want something that's easy to remember, hard to guess, but is sufficiently long to make it difficult for brute force attacks. So you do have the option to modify your password history, how many passwords have been retained. We're gonna go to maximum password age, and by setting that to a zero, that means the password will not expire. We're, go we're not going to change a password unless we truly think it needs to be changed. And in the same vein, we're gonna allow passwords to be changed as often as, wa as we want. Here's the key, minimum password length. I'm gonna set it to 20 because that's a pretty solid password, but I want you to watch very carefully what happens. Set it to 20 and it, go, and it goes back to 14. That's because this is the longest minimum password length that Windows will allow. Now I would recommend we stick with password must meet complexity requirements. That is at least one alpha, lowercase, one uppercase alpha, one numeric, one special and unless you have a specific reason to change this never store your passwords using reversible encryption 
Now we're going to go to our account lockout location and we're going to set the lockout for 30 minutes. In other words, an account will be locked out for 30 minutes and then it, would, and then it will enable again. And when I click apply, Active Directory automatically gives us five invalid long, logon attempts over the course of 30 minutes. In other words, these five invalid logon attempts must occur within the same span of 30 minutes for a lockout to occur. And we're done. All right. So as a reminder, we're now going to go to renaming the domain administrator accounts. And we're going to create a user, a standard user called administrator as a form of a honeypot. So before I go back to server, we're going to go to Windows Client, File Explorer. We're going to click on Network and Network Search Active Directory. I want you to see that a standard user, just a member of the domain users, has read access to view your entire Active Directory tree, which also means they can see here is our built-in administrator account. So we are going to rename the administrator account, but we're also going to create a dummy admin account. Back to Windows Server. We're going to close out of default domain policy and group policy in general. We're going to work with an Active Directory here. All right, first thing I'm going to do is go to my administrator account. And we're going to, I'm a Lord of the Rings fan, so we're going to make this Aragorn just to just to move move along quickly I wouldn't recommend using something like Aragorn uh, it, it should be as innocuous and stand out as little as possible something like this would definitely jump out at someone as being a special account um, okay All right, right here we're just being told we should log off and log back on right now so we're gonna do that Logging back on. Oh. I uh, tried to log on as administrator. There we go. Back to users. Now, we also want to change that description but I'm going to hold, I'm going to copy it because it's going to go into our standard administrator account. Um, we're going to put here just a plain user. And we're going to jump to our Windows client and do another find. And you will now see Aragorn, just a plain user. So now we have hidden our domain admin account. We're now going to file new user, create a new administrator account. All right. And let's create a password. Great. Oh, and the other item Once too many. Back to our Windows client. And now we have potentially fooled any malicious individuals browsing our Active Directory database. Now we're going to set up account, account access auditing so that we can see if someone is trying to break into our administrator account. So we go back into group policy, back to our default domain policy, policies, Windows settings, security, local policies, audit policy, and we want account logon attempts. 
as opposed to audit logon attempts. Note we want audit account logon attempts. To find these settings, we want both success and failure. Now back to our client. And by simply going to the find filter, anyone on our network can then identify our domain controller. And incidentally, that's not the only place from a Windows command prompt the command set can be issued. And right here is our logon server as well. All right, so MSTSC is a shortcut to get to remote desktop. Type in DC01, more choices, administrator, and we will pound on this a few times. And not sure why. I wasn't shooting up to the focus of the screen. All right, so we have performed a couple of logon attempts that have been failures. Now, so now we'll go to the event viewer. Windows logs, security log. Oh, hang on a second. We don't see any account failures. Oh, we do have new events. Maybe they're just running a little behind. Can anyone take a guess as to why we didn't see the event failures. Okay, we'll see if you got it right. The reason is because we configured the group policy object, but we did not force group policy processing to occur. So we need to go to GP update slash force, update the policy while that occurs. All right, we're back to Windows client. And we've got a failure, Windows Server, right click security, and there we go, audit failure. Incidentally, let's do it one more time. Hmm. And now the user account has been locked. Too many logon attempts. So there is a great way to identify if you've got a malicious user trying to break into your network. Now as bonus material, I'm going to demonstrate what Microsoft documentation says should allow us to go a step further and completely hide our Aragorn account from Active Directory. Uh, I've tried it and it has not worked. So we go to View, Advanced Features, we go back to Users, Double click Aragorn, we go to Attribute Air Editor, and this information can also be found by navigating to ADSI Edit, which we'll do in just a moment. And we go to Show in Advanced View Only and set to True. And apply. OK. Tell you what, just for grins, I'll do another GP update slash force, but we'll also go to ADSI Edit. And we right-click the node, left-click Connect to, and by default it will then pull up the domain controller. And let's navigate down to Aragorn, Properties, same information. All right, um, Show, sorry, Show. Okay, and we now see that we've set that hit that setting so just for grins we'll try one more time and I sure would be happy if it would work but for some reason it doesn't okay Now this next one's a little bit harder to do, but do not use the same local administrator password across your organization, and definitely don't use group policy to do it. It turned out that was a very insecure way to set the local admin password, as that password was stored in clear text in the group policy object itself. Instead, use Microsoft Laps to help you automate the generation of unique passwords for every one of your machines. Why is this important? If a computer gets compromised, and the local admin password 
is also part of that compromise. If it's used across the organization, then malware can spread very easily from computer to computer by simply authenticating using that local admin account. I remember about seven years ago when I really got serious about being a sysadmin, there were three applications that we updated through group policy. They were Java, Adobe Reader, and Adobe Flash. Well, in 2017, I think most of us are using our browser to open PDFs, and Flash, mercifully, is going away. However, if your organization still requires Java, it's a good idea to use either group policy or system center, if you have a bit more robust environment, to automate the installation of security patches for Java. System Center is especially helpful as it will provide reporting and feedback when installations fail. To add yet another layer of protection for your desktops, you can use group policy software restriction policies to block executables from running in temporary locations, which is a great way to stop malware and ransomware. And if you wanna get really hardcore, use AppLocker to whitelist applications. Just keep in mind that before you roll either of these technologies out in production, build yourself a virtual lab using, build yourself a lab, perhaps using virtualization and a separate OU and test these out and try to get things is, and try to get all of the kinks worked out in your lab environment before you roll this out to your end users. And while Microsoft Windows does a pretty good job of locking down ports through Windows Firewall, you may find that your environment has some unique requirements, and we will show you how to go in and use group policy to configure Windows Firewall to tailor your environment. So I'm gonna move into focus here, a virtual machine running Windows Server, and this is an Active Directory domain controller, and I'm gonna demonstrate a tool called PSExec. Uh, I imagine many of you have used this before. It is a very powerful tool to uh, manage Windows desktops through the command line. And I'm going to open up an administrative command prompt. And what we have, we'll just put it here, what we have is a Windows server on this IP address, 10.199.101, and a Windows client on 10.199.102. Now, I can't ping it probably because of Windows Firewall but you can see that we do resolve the host name. So the syntax for psexec is just psexec.exe and you can use the tab key to fill that out and slash slash windows client space cmd to get to a remote command prompt. Now, it's not going to work because Windows Firewall by default blocks this and is a good reason because these tools are great for sysadmins but they can also be used by malicious users if they have more domain privileges than they require. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump into the group policy management editor and we're going to drill down from our forest into our domain and we're gonna look at pre-period group policy objects and we have one called Windows Firewall. And if I go under the settings and click show all, you'll see what I've done is we have enabled remote service management and one of the key things I want to point out here is I've only allowed remote service management to be enabled to this IP address, the IP address of our Windows server. In a full-scale enterprise environment, what, what we recommend at Sabre is that your technicians operate on a separate VLAN from the rest of your network traffic and you only open up these type of rules for that VLAN. Now let me show you by issuing a right click and edit just where you would go in to make these changes in group policy. They are under computer configuration, settings, Windows settings, security settings, Windows firewall with advanced security. And it's an inbound rule. So, so what I actually did is just issued a right click and new, and new rule. And so for those of you who are familiar here, we'll, we'll go back through the process. So it's Windows, and no, it's remote service management. So, ah, I missed one previously. Um, this, is, this is very similar to what Windows Firewall with advanced security looks like if you're doing it directly on the machine. Now, what I do wanna show is you can right click and go into properties, and this is very much like it looks in Windows 7 and Windows 10. And here is where I set 
uh, my rules to only work from this one IP address. If I click add, you'll see that you have the option to, to do a single host. You can do a predefined range of IP addresses or you can do an entire subnet. Now what we do from here is the Windows client is currently in an OU called desktop computer. So we need to link that OU to, excuse me, we need to link that GPO to this OU. So we issue a right click, link existing GPO, and select Windows Firewall. Once that's done, you would normally have to wait anywhere from 90 to 120 minutes before your Windows clients um, refresh group policy. But since we have a direct connection to this client, We'll just go right here, open up an administrative command prompt. And as you can see, I'm not running as a full-blown administrator, another great recommendation for managing Windows desktops. So we open up our administrative command prompt and the command we use to force group policy to update is called GP update. And the switch is slash force. Now, if you wanna get extra fancy, you can add slash target colon computer and only, yeah, and only refresh computer group policy updates. In other words, this is gonna be slightly faster. So group policy has completed successfully. Now let's go back into our Windows server and that very same PS exec command we issued earlier, here we'll clear the screen up arrow twice, should happen almost instantaneously. And there we go. So I want you to note that our prompt or, or rather the, the title of our command prompt has changed. It now says slash slash Windows client and CMD. So for example, if I issue the command hostname, I'll see that I'm on the Windows client. I can, who am I? I can see who I'm logged in as, and I'm logged in with uh, the account that I'm using on the Windows computer. And from here, you can issue commands such as IP config, you can start and stop services. There's a host of things you can do from, from uh, PSExec that makes it a very, very handy tool. And now let's look at some things we can do from the network standpoint to protect ourselves against ransomware. One thing you can do is isolate hosts using VLANs. So for example, if you're a school, you could create VLANs for your teacher staff computers, your students, phones, printers, cameras. The idea here is apply ACLs between these VLANs so that devices that do not need to be able to communicate with one another cannot. This will help against the spread of worms. And if you want even an additional layer of security, private VLANs can be used to restrict hosts from being able to communicate within the same layer to subnet. Next, we're going to look at how we can harden our network against various man-in-the-middle attacks. If a cyber criminal is on premise with a Kali Linux virtual machine, there's a great deal of damage they can do. We're going to look at how we can protect against MAC address cam table overflows using switch port security and MAC address limiting. Then we're going to look at how we can use DHCP snooping to protect against a rogue DHCP server. And once DHCP snooping has been turned on, we can then use it to employ dynamic ARP inspection and IP source guard, which makes sure that MAC addresses and IP addresses cannot be spoofed. And finally, we're going to look at how we can protect our spanning tree topology. If spanning tree is not properly protected, a malicious individual could introduce a switch into the network or make some topology changes that causes the root bridge to change, which could possibly direct all th traffic through a malicious user switch, thereby giving them access to read all of our traffic. Additionally, if we're in an environment that uses a dynamic routing protocol, such as EIGRP or OSPF, we need to set up authentication between routing protocol neighbors to make sure that a malicious individual could not spoof a routing protocol. And by employing passive interfaces, we can make sure that EIGRP and OSPF hellos do not occur on interfaces that will never form an adjacency. Take a moment to make a mental note of this topology. It's very basic. What we're going to look at is how we can use an MD5 hash to authenticate routing peers. On the left, we have a Juniper router, and on the right, we have a Cisco router. We're also going to talk about how configuring uh, certain interfaces to be passive can be very beneficial. We're going to look at how if someone were to put an unauthorized router or even perhaps a Linux virtual machine uh, that can run OSPF, into your net into your switch network they could form an unauthorized 
routing protocol adjacency and gain a great deal of uh, information about your network topology. So we're going to go ahead and jump into our network here and forgot to reset my terminals just to make things pretty. All right, so So let's look again. So router one has interface EM30 pointing downstream to a PC, and I've verified we have IP reachability. And then router one on EM00 is IP address 10.0.0.1. Router two, fast ethernet 00, is 10.0.0.2. And downstream on FA01 is to this network segment right here. So we're going to go ahead and set up our routing protocol using MD5 hashing. All right. So uh, the green router is Juniper. The Cyan router is Cisco. So we'll start off with Juniper. You first go into edit and then edit protocols OSPF area 0, set interface EM0, we'll do 3.0, and then we'll set interface EM0.0. Now we're going to do up arrow authentication MD5. Key ID is one and the key will make it saber. And whoop, commit and quit. So we've saved our configuration for OSPF on Juniper. Now we'll go to Cisco, configure terminal router OSPF 10, network 10.0.0.2, there it is zero. Right now we go directly. Well, I guess you could do it two ways. We'll go ahead and set area zero authentication message digest here, so that if we were to put other interfaces into area zero, we automatically are anticipating uh, authentication. So now into interface FA zero, we will do our command IP OSPF message. Digest key, uh, key one, MD5, saber. And in just a moment here, okay, we have an adjacency. But we did forget to do one thing. We need to go back into router OSPF and we need to issue a network uh, 172.17.0.1. And we'll put it in area one. And let's do a show IP and brief to make sure I issued, yep, I did get the correct command. So show IP route from Cisco. All right, we have learned a network via OSPF. So let's see if we can ping that downstream host, 172.16.0.50. And there we go. So we should have full adjacency. And this is our, this is our simulated PC in GNS3. And there we go. So let's look at our topology one more time. So now we are gonna plug in our nasty little router here that is, again, it could be a router, it could be a Linux virtual machine running OSPF. And let's demonstrate what we could do here. Let's reset that terminal. Show IP in brief. All right, so we have we have obtained an IP address on the LAN segment. Let's verify we can ping 16.0.1. There we go. So unless we secure that VLAN on the Juniper switch or that simulated VLAN on the Juniper router, I should say, we can go in switch and we can do network 172.16.0.200 area 0. There we go. And so now we have formed an adjacency which means we can do a show IP route and we have learned both an inter-area route as well as an inter 
area route, intra area route. And so this guy theoretically has your entire route table. Now protecting against this form of attack is actually pretty straightforward. We just go back into our Juniper router and to edit and to edit uh, protocols plus PF area zero, set interface EM 3.0, question mark. We are looking for passive commit and quit. And let's go up here and let's do that show IP OS PF neighbor command. So watch our dead timer. Okay, we just missed a hello. So in 25 seconds, this router is going to lose its adjacency and would not be able to recreate it. So while we wait for this dead timer to finish up, we looked over two things today. We looked over how to do some very basic authentication using mes message digest between OSPF peers. I demonstrated the syntax in both Cisco as well as Juniper. And we looked at configuring interfaces to be passive in Juniper. And it is, and the syntax is almost identical in Cisco. Let's in fact look at that real quick. Gotta slow down. Um, let's see, uh, blah, 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 blah. what is it? Well, you could do it a couple ways. One, you could do passive interface. Um, you could do passive interface FA0 slash one, or what you could do is passive interface default, and then interface, hmm, interface what? Oh, oh, it's a no passive interface FA0 slash zero. That'll do the job. And there it goes, received its hello. All right. And by all means, if you're still using Telnet as the protocol to manage your routers and switches, transition to SSH as quickly as you can. Passwords in Telnet are sent in clear text, which means anyone listening with a sniffer can read those passwords. That can be a very bad situation. Okay, so that's a wrap. Be sure to visit us at www.saber.com. That's S-A-B-Y-R.com. And feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel and watch out for videos in the future. I'm Jeremy Cooper, and thank you for viewing.